It's 8.45 this morning. Mark Lawrence, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, I'm good, thank you. Uh, really interesting weekend of football. On the face of it, at the start of the weekend, this, the fixture list wasn't great. And then all of a sudden, loads of little different um, uh, nuggets emerge. It, let's, let's, mm. uh, let's start with West Ham, actually, because they've been so close and the form has been so good, even when the injuries happened. And then Antonio comes back from injury and scores twice before the weekend. You're like, wow, they're actually going to do it. And then Everton roll in, whose form has been flaky, except away from home and do them. Uh, that must be devastating for Moyes at this stage. Yeah, um, I speak to him on a regular basis. I don't think he's necessarily devastating, but he, he was he was always worried about this game because they won the uh, original fixture, didn't they, in, uh, at Goodison when he took West Ham back there. And he said, it's a real tricky one. And he said, everyone keeps saying to me, oh, you know, you beat Everton and the rest of your fixtures look relatively easy. But it's not the way that the, the Premier League is. And Everton away from home are a completely different animal to them to they are at home. And just I was listening obviously to the bit about Seamus Coleman. If you remember, he played as well at uh, Liverpool in the derby in that particular position as he did yesterday. So massive credit to him. I think the thing with David Moyes, he, he knows he's up against it to finish fourth. Um, but he'll, he'll be Europa League, which for, for West Ham, obviously, if he'd said at the start of the season, sat down with the two owners and he said, by the way, we'll, we'll get definitely Europa League, then it's not your hand off, I think. It's going to be strange to have a situation when fans come back and the support group is actually fully behind the club because it felt like West Ham was just constantly in the cycle of uh, a, an adversary crowd almost every single week. Whereas they're going to come back and David Moyes is going to be a god to these people. Well, listen, have you have, have you been to the Olympic stadium when when West Ham are playing? No. Honestly, it's like being in a library. It's it was obviously built for the Olympics, uh, and you know, you you're miles away from the pitch. The noise just dissipates into the air, even if you've got fifty odd thousand there, which you have on on regular re occasions, and it's soulless, um, and it's not the easiest pitch. Uh, sorry, yeah, well, the easiest pitch and easiest stadium to play in. So, um, listen, he's, he's, he's done a fabulous job. Um, he's always one of those, Moyes, if you give him enough time, he gets your team extremely well organised, he makes you, as a team, very, very difficult to beat. And then he drops the odd, odd nugget in there in terms of transfer. I mean, I've never known anybody in terms of bringing players in, the number of times he'll go and see them, his assistant will go and see them. He'll send the, the world and his wife to go and see them. And, I mean, we, we joke with him all the time because we say his, his favourite three words are, I'm not sure. And he's very <laughs> much like that with players. But, you know, um, he's done a fabulous job there. And you just wonder, don't you, that uh, if they'd let him stay at Manchester United, I know it's completely different, but if they'd let him stay, it, it might have been a different story. But, hey, he's at West Ham now. Do you, uh, do you think the Champions League is gone? I mean, we, we've seen, that's the other story yeah. of the weekend, is that Leicester, Leicester look like they're starting to tie up just a little bit. I just I just think West Ham will fall short. I mean, Lingard cannot continue the form that he's had. He's been ab absolutely brilliant. You can argue as, as good for, for West Ham as maybe Fernandez has been for Manchester United. Such a massive, massive influence scored in wonder goals and if not he's not scoring he's, he's creating I, I just think it feels a little bit like they might have run the race West Ham they, they started to look a little bit leggy as well um yeah I, th I think they might just miss out but you know Europa League's fine for them isn't it and and so at this stage right so just for the for people who might not have the table in front of them Leicester have 63 points mm. West Ham have 58 points and they've played the same number of games on 35, so they've got three games left. Liverpool have four games left on, on 57 points, which if they were to win that game in hand, which as we know is actually the Manchester United game really, um, would put them up to 60 and three points behind Leicester. You'd, you'd favour Leicester at this stage, but Leicester's performance against Newcastle was so bad that actually... And the fixture list, Manchester United, Chelsea, Spurs is Leicester's conclusion. Yeah, um, but then again, when when you know when you're playing those teams, you don't know what their situations are. I mean, Manchester United are virtually guaranteed Champions League, so mm. with with the number of fixtures they've got as well, it'd be interesting to see what team that uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer picks to play against Leicester. You just you just you just never know, and you know 
when the, when when Leicester played Chelsea, if if Leicester virtually guaranteed, sorry, Chelsea virtually guaranteed as well to be in in the Champions League, will they change their team because of the Champions League final? So it's really about all on the day. Le- Leicester throw results in like this on occasion. Just talking about West Ham, I remember I think relatively start of the season where West Ham went to Leicester. Did they not win three nil? And we're kind of thinking, oh. But that's Le- I think that's Leicester. They just they just occasionally just they have a re- very very poor performance. It just seems to be everybody. But I still think they've got the tools to actually make it by, by the last game. Liverpool also have to to hold up their end of the bargain though. If if Leicester mm. do crumble a little bit, is there is there enough from what you've seen on Saturday night to to suggest that this Liverpool team are going to get twelve points from a possible twelve? No, no. no I'd love I'd love to say yeah. I think I think you know. Klopp gambled a little bit, obviously, at the weekend in terms of the two central defenders. And, and he, he's obviously decided, I think everyone's been saying to him, look, you just got to leave Fabinho in midfield. He's a completely different player. He, with, with the absence of Henderson, he, make, he makes such a difference. So I just think they look vulnerable. Um, they look vulnerable on the counter-attack. Southampton played quite well for long periods of that game, even when they were 1-0 down and, and they did create opportunities. And you might argue on the day that Alisson was was one of the best players that, that Liverpool had. So that, that worries me. And I think um, they still look a little bit leggy. Oh, they were better as well at the weekend because they hadn't played for a week with the game against Manchester United being postponed, etc. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm still not convinced. And um, the fact that they, they look vulnerable, and I think they know that they're vulnerable. That's the problem. The players take to the pitch and it's almost like fingers crossed. Hopefully we don't concede today. And I think, you know, that the two previous games against uh, against Newcastle and, and, and Leeds, that's where Liverpool are at the moment. And they just need, they need a rest, basically. All those players need a rest, especially with the way that the that, clock that demands that they play the football. And it's touch and go for me whether they actually get in. I'm, I'm totally not convinced at all. Mark, we, we were having this conversation a little bit earlier on. After his victory at Quail Hollow, Roy McIlroy came off and said, mm. I, re- I really miss the fans. The fans made a big difference. I really feed off the energy of the crowd. We've been having this conversation about Liverpool for such a long period of time now during lockdown that it, it seems like it's nonsensical that all the teams should be affected equally. But when Roy McIlroy comes off and says, actually, I really needed that, and you know, may- maybe it's completely in his head and it's not real, but he believes it to be real, and so therefore his perception is reality. Is there a possibility that Liverpool are a completely different team next year with the energy of the Anfield crowd? I think it's. I don't think it's a possibility. I think it's a probability. And I, and I get. I mean, fantastic for Rory McIlroy because obviously it's over 500 days since he last won or something. But I mean, wow. Would you wouldn't you be like to be able to play golf like him and be so kind of supple and and stuff the way that he plays? So good luck to him. But yeah, no. Listen, yeah. I was. Um, I read an article in one of the weekend um, papers, and I think it was uh, who was it? The guy who oh, was a, who's a lad at West Ham who's been there for years, midfield player, captain. Mark Noble. Was, say again. Mark Noble. Sorry, Mark Noble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking props. God knows where that came from. <laughs> and and he w- he was interviewed by Jamie Redknapp, and they were talking about you know different things about football, and obviously, and the, the crowds came up, and Mark Noble just said, you know, he said. Nobody realises when you go to Anfield more than anywhere else when you're the opposition. Said so it feels like that the the, the the cop sucked the ball in, you know, and they certainly kind of suck you in as as a player. And he said they, as a as a home crowd, have the biggest influence on any other team and place that he's ever played against in it and and in. So it, it does make a difference. It makes it makes a massive different and you know the, the thing about Liverpool as well and, and the punters have always been the same for a, lo- for a long long time if you give absolutely everything for them they can forgive you having a you know on occasion a, a bad day or you know missing chances etc but there's always that thing when you know all of a sudden Liverpool need something as a team and more often than not they get it they get it from the crowd and it, it does really make a difference look all the, all the results that we've seen, forget about Liverpool's results, look at everybody's results generally, apart from the odd one like City, etc. And it just made a massive, massive difference, no crowds. 
There was obviously the highlights of Liverpool against Barcelona during the rounds last week because it was two years to the day since the, the comeback. Mm. And I'm not sure that we not quite appreciated at the time, but Jordi Alba's face after Origi scores early on just illustrates how much this crumble was about to happen. And that has to come not only from the early goal, but the in incredible volume that I suspect was inside Anfield that night. It's not just the early soccer punch. It's just, as you say, that crowd either sucking the ball in or absolutely psyching you out if you're an opponent in that stadium. Yeah. And um, you know you know when you play that um, you've got to be 101% on, on those particular nights because it's, it, it's demanded of you. And I think it's one of the great things I think about the manager, which is, you know, he, he knew straight away when he when he got the job there exactly the situ what the situation was. What's that you were demanded that you give up, as I said, absolutely everything every time you play. But certainly, certainly on nights like that, you know, it, and as daft as this sounds, the darkness has got something to do with it as well. It's always, always, even in my time there, in my what seven, eight, eight years, always, always. That game at night, the atmosphere was probably another 10, 15, maybe 20%. It's just different in the day, but at that that night thing is, is is amazing. And you just get, you feel this surge of kind of, you feel the surge of passion and you realize that, you know, it, this this is do or die. And that's that's why you've got so many fabulous nights. And I know supporters of other clubs go, oh, they always go on about this. And, you know, well, what about Old Trafford for this and, and City or whatever, all those other places. I'm telling you, it's just completely different. And even if I hadn't, I mean, I played there for for other teams against Liverpool before I went there, and it's palpable. It really seriously is. You can, you just feel it all the time. And you know what? As an opposition player, as soon as you make a mistake, you're thinking, "Crikey, we're in trouble here." And that's, I mean, that night against, I was in, I was working for the television as well that night. I mean, that was just the Barcelona night for me was the best ever. Mm. Like, and that's why we brought it up on the back of, of Rory. The, like, next season is going to be very interesting because we'll have, I think, four genuine contenders. City are going to be there. Chelsea are definitely going to mm -hmm. be there. The turnaround on Tuchel is spectacular. The age profile yeah. of that team is, is brilliant. You're going to have Manchester United and you're going to have Liverpool. But the Manchester United question, that came up a little bit earlier on in the show as well. I'm not sure I understand what the truth is about United. That It's brilliant that they keep having these second-half comebacks. And it's brilliant that they show the resilience to go behind in games and win those matches and they've got more points from losing positions blah 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 but they keep going behind in games and that's not sustainable over a two three year period where you keep going behind against particularly against the better sides yeah well you're not going to win the league that way but i think it just it just it shows that the best part of manchester united's team is from midfield going forward and they've got so many talented players in in both departments and, you know, even though defensive, they, they have improved. I'm still not convinced about Lindelof. Um, I'm, I think the jury's out a little bit on the goalkeeper as well yet because he's not come under real immense pressure. So, you know, if they could get another centre-back to play a, 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 a alongside the captain, that would make a, a, a massive difference because uh, Harry Maguire is, is while, while he's lacking a little bit of pace, it would not be an issue if he's got somebody alongside him who's, who's extremely rapid. So I think they probably need three players, Manchester United. We all sit here and know we need this and need that. I think they probably need three players. And I think, you know, then they've got a, a really, really good chance because, you know, like the Greenwood and your Rashford and all these lads, you forget how young they are. And they're only going to get better and better. Um, and the fellow Fernandez has just been sensational for them and, and by the way if there's one person you want to keep it's Cavani because his movement well we saw it yesterday when he came on his you just knew as soon as that ball came on you just kind of knew that he'd be the first to it and all, all he needed was a little touch and, and that's all he gave it and I think it's imperative that, that they keep him I don't know why he wants to go home because he could have another year in front of like 70 odd thousand at Old Trafford and he will become a legend so they need a centre back, a defensive central midfielder, and is it? Do they need a new goalkeeper, or is Henderson good enough if they sell De Gea? Well, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know why you would sell De Gea. I'm not sure unless unless he obviously completely just wants out, and I know he's on on, on massive money, but your goalkeeper is massive, 
Um, and Henderson did extremely well at Sheffield United, as we know, and he's done okay at Manchester United. But all of a sudden, I think when he realised ultimately that he's the number one, that's when the pressure starts. And the other thing with Manchester United, generally, we would imagine next year, in most games, they'll be in control. He probably won't have much to do. And I think that's, that's oh, therein lies the big problem for goalkeepers. The best goalkeepers in the world aren't the ones who make all the saves all the time in the game. They are the ones at the top clubs who maybe for 10, 15 minutes don't touch the ball, but occasionally, you know, the, oppo the opposition get an opportunity and, and the goalkeeper has to make a top pass save. So it's not just about ability, it's massively about concentration, all those kind of things. So I just think with Henderson, so far so good, but to actually have a fabulous chance of winning the league, it remains to be seen. Look at, look at the Chelsea goal, goalkeeper, he's done fab. And when he first came, we all kind of thought, oh, he's not too good with his feet. He's not good with it. He's, he's done fabulous. And I know, obviously, in front of them, they've been um, very, very good, whether it's three or five or, or whatever it is. But nobody talks about him anymore because they just think he's, he's a top class goalkeeper. I, I know you're making the point that the knees additions defensively and that's where they need to improve at the same time mm. i think at the end of last season when we were making a case for united as potential title challengers this season we were talking about mason greenwood as one player who was going to kick on and it obviously hasn't happened for him for a number of reasons until the last couple of months and he scored five goals in five games now i think it is in in the premier league anyway sure. and then the europa league on top of that like this guy like this guy obviously i mean is just a, a level above every other kid that united seem to have had over the last five ten years it seems he's like matching sure. wayne rooney's records now at at this point he is one of the factors why united fans even though it's not a defensive acquisition or a defensive addition for next season has to give a lot, a lot of united fans a lot of hope oh i mean is he left footed or right footed mm. You know, that's that, that's the first thing which is most unusual as, as, as we've seen. I mean, it's one of the strangest things in, in modern day football is why the majority of the players aren't too footy. It, it, it is amazing, but this, this kid certainly is. He knows where the goal is, which, which is fabulous. Um, he can play through the middle. He can play in a three on the right, play in a three on the left. I think he gets he gets the thing that as you're a Manchester United player, you've also got to be able to defend, which for players like him and Rashford is more about being in position rather than anything else. And it would appear that he seems to be quite a decent lad, very, very modest, which obviously you love because if it goes to the head a little bit, that, that's a worrying thing. But he's just going to be a, a top, top player. And, and the Rashford fellow, we haven't even seen the best of him yet. Um, you know, look, yesterday was just so, so strong and so, so quick. And he suddenly got a bit of devil in him as well, which I love. That uh, I had a bit, I don't, I think it was one of the, 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 the Villa back four players yesterday and a bit of pushing and shoving. And I think he had a kick at him as well, Rashid, which, which, which <laughs> thankfully the referee didn't see. But as a coach, you're thinking, good on you, which is, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't want to be beaten here. And, and for, for young players coming into the game, it, there's, a, there's an awful lot to learn, you know, it, it's like you come in, you do well, and then you get rested a little bit, and then you come back in and you maybe don't do quite as well. And I've always said as well with, with, with young players that, you know, it's quite good sometimes just to sit in the stand and watch your team play. And also maybe watch the person who plays on your position and just see what he does. Because like anything in life, you, you can always improve. Uh, Big Sam's great record, Mark, we might uh, finish up on this, uh, has gone, it has disappeared. The, the man who never got relegated has all of a sudden got relegated. Uh, like, I mean, there was early signs, maybe, that performance against Liverpool around Christmas time where we thought that this might actually happen for West Brom, that he might have turned it around, but mm -hmm. maybe he just didn't have the players this season. Do, does he get uh, another gig like this again to, to try and save a team from relegation danger in the near future? Will he? Well, I think... I think I think he'll stay with West Brom, and, I, and quite honestly, he'll probably bring them back up. Um, and I think that's probably going to be his last job. And I, I know when the phone rings and someone says, "No, oh, we need you, Sam." Obviously, he he, he dons his uh, Superman gear on and, and off he goes. But I, I just think that uh, that West Brom will be daft to let him go. He's got massive experience. He knows he knows the championship. Um, he knows players. And he knows how to get out the championship, and it you know it won't be pretty, but it will be very very effective. 
And I think then if he does that and gets them back in the Premier League after that year in the Premier League, whatever happens, I think he'll probably call it a day, to be honest with you. And I think his, I think his missus will be on at him as well, saying, have you not had enough of this stupid game already? And an uh, underappreciated part of the decision-making process there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's just got, you know, he's, he's, he's just got massive, massive experience. He knows how to deal with agents, which sounds a bit daft, but that's, you know, that's part and parcel of it. He can pick the, the phone up to, to, to most people in regards of asking about players. And you know one thing about him, and everybody's got this uh, opinion of, of Sam Allardyce from, from maybe not knowing him, but you ask any players who've ever played for him, and they actually, they absolutely love him because just said he, he's, a real, he's a real player's man. Yes, he's tough. You know, and yes, he'll give it to you um, in dressing rooms, etc. But it, it's it's always very, very fair. Um, look, he's, he's got he's got a, fab, a fabulous record. I don't think anybody really thought they would keep West Brom because they, they were never ever good enough in terms of the personnel, and and that's obviously been shown out from from when he's been there. Even though he's, he really has improved them, but no, he'll he'll be back. He'll be back as long as he doesn't beat Preston home and away next season. I'm I'm not bothered. Mark, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers for joining us this morning. Pleasure. Cheers. Mark Lawrence, give us some thoughts on the weekend's football there. You can get in touch with us. 0879 180 180 is the number. Um, we were going to do contenders for player of the season, but Mark, we'll get them a little bit later on. Is, there, is it a long long list or is it a short list at this point? Well, your, your boy Jack Grealish and his injury really uh, scuppered his claim to the title, I think. Uh, Harry Kane will be looking around and seeing him in uh, the rearview mirror by some distance. Ruben Diaz. Uh, would be uh, another contender. There was some we had a conversation last week about Ederson potentially being in the mix, but I think that was uh, quickly rubbished. Uh, so Ruben Diaz, Harry Kane, like Bruno, Bruno, Bruno Fernandez, obviously been absolutely sensational, and uh, they would be your three. De Bruyne, I would say. De Bruyne as well. Like obviously he had a bit of his injury troubles after Christmas. Maybe came back from them relatively well, very well. Yeah, and I guess he's being judged on last season's base on a on a numbers level. I'm not sure how he's doing in, in comparison to that, but I, I suspect it's not quite at that level of, of output, even though he's been just as effective. So maybe that's a little bit unfair to tar him with that. I, I do think, though, that, that Harry Kane is, is probably the front runner. Do you think so? Yeah, I, really? Yeah. Okay. I would have said that uh, Bruno was ahead of him.